Storytelling in video games is often a simple but effective matter. You got your typical save the world plots that aren't super complicated. Mario saves Princess Peach from Bowser in the Super Mario series. Stuff like that. But not every game will settle for such an unconvoluted plot, and that's where the long-form storytelling of the RPG comes into play. RPGs are famous for being hundreds of hours long, but this can run into a problem. Padding. So many RPGs are just full of stuff that doesn't add anything to the story. Even some of my favorites have their moments dedicated to chasing animals around the city. Oftentimes, the players can forget about these things. They can forget about the creep they helped out to get to the Fifth Sanctuary in Mother 2, or all the backtracking around for General White that was in Paper Mario at the Thousand Year Door. Why? Because god damn it, RPGs love to stick the landing. That's right, today we're going to be talking about why RPG endings are some of the most phenomenal endings in all of media. As somebody who spends a lot of time playing them, I like to think I'm a pretty good authority on this subject. Granted, I'm not a pretty good authority on other media, but ignore that. I wrote Ghosters. So, what are some great RPG endings? I guess before we get into what a great RPG ending is, we have to classify what an ending to an RPG is. I'm going to say that it's from the cutscene before the final boss fight, but obviously that's not a perfect metric and you are free to disagree with me loudly in the comments below if you'd like. I just didn't know where else to cut it off. Anyway, on to some of the RPG endings that definitely resonated with me the most. Would this be an Arcadian Everlasting video without Chrono Trigger being mentioned in it? No. So there. I've mentioned it. It has a good ending that I like quite a bit. All the loose ends are tied up besides one, and I'm satisfied with it. However, I don't want to talk about Chrono Trigger again. I've literally spent four videos where I talk about it at length, three of those being exclusively about topics related to Chrono Trigger, so I won't talk about it more than that. Instead, I'm going to look at one of its contemporaries, Final Fantasy VI. Despite what my videos might have you believe, I like Final Fantasy VI far more than I like Chrono Trigger. However, Final Fantasy VI definitely has much more of a filler problem than Chrono Trigger does. Chrono Trigger's pacing is very snappy and it doesn't waste your time with much. Final Fantasy VI features a segment where you help a feral child find a diving helmet. Despite this, Final Fantasy VI's ending manages to be an incredible feat of narrative prowess. After all the buildup of the adventure to get there, including tons of hours of preparation to get the ultimate equipment like Illumina and the Paladin Shield, you finally arrive at the top of Kefka's tower to confront the villain himself. And if you were smart, you picked up all 14 party members. This is integral to the ending playing out in the best way because Final Fantasy VI is ultimately a game about purpose being created through the communities and connections we make. It's here, at the top of his tower and the center of his plans, where we finally see Kefka's motivations. We learn that he wants to end all life because he believes it's the only way to end suffering. Suffering is caused by existence. From here we get an existential conversation between main character Terra and Kefka about the nature of life, and for a Super Nintendo game from 1994, it's some pretty solid stuff. Kefka sees existence as the root of suffering, yet Terra sees existence as defiance against suffering. The philosophical battle here ultimately ends with Terra's ideas winning. Each party member except for, like, the fucking Yeti, has a reason to hold on to living and they all give why. Locke, the heartbroken thief for his new love, Cyan to find his own purpose in a world that has robbed him of everything, Sabin to reignite his relationship with his brother Edgar. Everyone comes together, and so Kefka initiates the final battle with them, the last stand against humanity from him. And it's so fucking epic, dude. Like seriously. The pipe organ, the drums, everything. This massive four-part song symbolizing the boss itself is so cool. Each phase having Kefka's theme interwoven through the power of light motif. You get fight a four-stage boss fight with each particular stage representing a part of the Divine Comedy, the famous three-book poem by Dante Alighieri. The bottom is Inferno with the angry, burly man representing Satan encased in ice in the book at the final layer of hell. The middle is Purgatorio, with the various human and animal shapes representing those who have to make the climb through Purgatory up into Heaven, and for the third stage we have Paradiso, 
which is represented with a false virgin Mary image that crumbles into the final stage, which is Dante's meeting with God. In the Divine Comedy, God tells Dante the meaning of life when they meet. In this version of events, the party meets Kefka in his angelic form here, and he instead tells them that life itself is meaningless. It's such a cool thematic twist on that idea. I love it to pieces. Why did this game suddenly become so philosophical? Because it's the end of an RPG, baby, and that's when things get really good. After a tense fight with Kefka, the party escapes from the tower in a wonderful sequence that combines all of their theme music into each other. The transitions between certain characters, for example the way Locke and the crestfallen ex-General Solis's theme interweave and interlock between each other in order to create a broken harmony like their tumultuous romance, or how the realm, the child artist's theme transitions into Shadow the Mercenary's theme to show the daughter's subtle connection to her estranged father, are all just so masterful. It's during this sequence that we learn that Terra might disappear with all the magic in the world, as they killed Kefka, who is the only thing keeping magic alive, and Terra is half Esper, which are beings to, that are just made of magic. Her heritage as a half Esper has led to her life being a very terrifying and traumatizing one, as it led to her being kidnapped from birth and brainwashed by the Empire as a living weapon. Her father's final words to her before disappearing forever are that as long as her human side holds on long enough, she can stay alive and keep doing what brings her purpose. The party's local airship owner, Setzer, barely gets them out of there in time, and when they escape, Terra's still there. She throws off her hairband and for the first time in the game lets her hair free from her ponytail as she casts aside the burdens of her heritage in a magic-free world. Edgar hits on Solis as he tends to do, Gal the wild child chases after some doves, Locke and Solis share a tender moment holding hands while the old samurai Saiyan takes a much needed nap. It's the perfect ending. We don't know what happens to the cast after Final Fantasy VI, but I've got a feeling that things worked out just fine for them. Final Fantasy VI has everything that I could want out of an RPG ending. A bunch of deep questions asked of the player thematically and philosophically, resolution to all of our characters, and most importantly, a Moogle. But resolution to all of the characters is a rule I'm willing to break for some situations. And this desperate situation calls for the desperate game known as Mother 3. Mother 3, you know, one of my favorite games of all time and a mainstay of this channel. I talk about it a bit, you know. However, I've steered clear of discussing the ending because everybody talks about this game's ending. If I had less restraint, I could tell you all about the game's ending from Chapter 8's beginning onward. But I won't do that because I set myself a guideline at the beginning of this video for a reason. So, let's get into that final boss encounter. But first, some proper context. Over the course of the journey, the party has been pursuing the Seven Needles. Lucas, the main character, and the enigmatic Masked Man are the only two characters who can pull these needles. If the Masked Man pulls all seven of the needles, or the majority of them, then something awful will happen. Nobody knows what it is, not even the Guardians of the Needles do. But it's alluded to as the end of the world, or some kind of eternal nothingness, due to the fact that the Masked Man has no heart to pass on to the dragon. It turns out that the annoying next-door neighbor from Mother 2, Porky, was behind the masked man's actions the entire time, controlling him like a robot. Porky is his own can of worms that we might open up some other day, but it's confirmed to us by Lucas's dad, Flint, that Porky's robot, the masked man, is actually Lucas's brother, Klaus, who went missing. In the first chapter of the game, Klaus goes to fight basically a robot dinosaur with a pocket knife, and he's never seen again. Flint goes to look for him in the mountains every day. Three years pass. And now, Lucas finally stands face to face with his brother once again. The masked man shoots a bolt of lightning at the party to wipe all of them out except Lucas, who reflects the bolt of lightning back with his Franklin badge. Even if you use your PSI or items to resurrect the other party members, the masked man will immediately KO them with a lightning bolt of rage. Despite all this, Lucas can't bring himself to hurt his brother. He just takes blow after blow from the masked man. It's a battle where you simply have to survive in order to win. This is a pattern throughout the Mother series, but this time there's nothing you can even do to progress the fight. There's no ears to listen to your singing like Gygus had in Mother 1, and there's no friends to pray to for help like in Mother 2. It's just you and the masked man. 
Flint takes a hit for you, but is consequently knocked out cold, and the masked man continues beating Lucas over and over. But then a voice comes between them, the voice of their mother, Hinawa, who died early on in the game. She tells them to stop fighting. As the fight goes on, she desperately continues to plead with them to stop fighting. And you're given a flashback to when they were born. Hinawa and Flint talk about how they'll grow up to be strong, supportive brothers. A future we know will never happen. Now, a slower, more melancholic version of the love theme that's been playing throughout the whole game begins to play, titled, It's Over. The masked man begins to look around, and Lucas starts to cry. I wouldn't blame you if you did too. Over the course of the whole game, it's incredibly obvious that the masked man is Klaus. There are moments where Lucas is mistaken for the masked man, or you'll realize that the masked man's attack noise is the same as Klaus's when he was briefly in your party. Flint even outright tells you before you fight the masked man that he's Klaus, and Hinawa assumes it throughout the battle. But it's never confirmed fully until right now. The tension is finally released when the masked man takes off his mask. The game says it simply. He looks just like Lucas. It's Klaus. Klaus aims directly at Lucas's Franklin badge and then shoots a lightning bolt at it, which bounces back and he kills himself. Klaus, faced with finally knowing the weight of what he's done, commits suicide. The last thing we hear from Klaus is, I'm sorry things turned out this way. Lucas remembered Klaus's smell is one of the strongest phrases from the scene to me because smells are often one of the things people remember about a person who's passed away. Flint asks Lucas to forgive Klaus because he was hasty and he breaks into tears as well. But Lucas soldiers on. He has bigger fish to fry. He goes up to the final needle, hoping beyond hope it'll save the world. He has a good heart, and that heart will be passed on to the dragon to save everyone. The game asks if you want to pull the final needle. If you refuse, Lucas pulls the needle anyway, because he has to. It's his duty. And we see the world end anyway. In spite of Lucas having a good heart and everything we've been told, the dragon wakes up and the world is completely destroyed. We get an epilogue in a black void where everyone seems to be happy, but we don't know what's happened. Is it the afterlife? The characters don't focus on their own situation too much, claiming that things will turn out fine for them. Instead, they wonder about our world. The player's world. Itoi has said before that Mother 4 is the real world, and I think that this is the ultimate expression of that. We take the lessons we learned from the Mother games and we ensure that the same mistakes aren't repeated in reality. And at the end of it all, we find a doorknob. The same doorknob that's been eluding us the entire game from chapter to chapter. This doorknob allows us to return to Mother 3 whenever we want to re-experience that world. It's a representation of the cartridge or the ROM or whatever you use to experience the world of Mother 3. It's eluded us this whole time, but it's here again. That's not where it ends. There's a cast role of characters that's just really charming after this, including a heart-wrenching moment where Klaus throws off the mask and runs to join his brother Lucas in a family shot at the very end. Of course, the final part of this parade is again the doorknob. We get the staff credits and then a twist. The game began on a black screen with a cyborg robotic logo that stated Mother 3 and the game ends with a fully organic logo that states Mother 3 on a white backdrop. Unlike every other Mother game, this game ends with a simple, the end. Every other Mother game has ended with a question mark, but this, this is truly the finale. I don't even know where to begin to explain how beautiful this ending is. It's such a melancholic, bittersweet tearjerker. We don't know where these characters ended up. Sure, they claim to be fine, but that's just them speaking to us in a black void. 
Considering the state of our world, Mother 4 might have a terrible ending as well. All we can do is hope, and believe in humans despite everything. Maybe you can call me Pollyanna for thinking like that. One game developer, Toby Fox, would be inspired by the Mother games to make a very different experience. I mean, you're more likely to know about this game than the other two games I've talked about so far, so let's cut straight to the chase. Undertale, you know it. You know what it's about, and you know that it has three different endings, each one very different from the others. The neutral ending being very unsatisfying, the passive ending being very great, and the genocide ending being the most horrific. The neutral ending is the ending you get just through playing the game normally, without trying to do anything fancy like sparing everyone or killing everyone. You know, just normal strolling through the underground, killing people you don't like, and sparing people you do like. Sounds like a Tuesday for me. This ending is actually interesting in that there are several different permutations you can get from it depending on who lived and who died in your playthrough. However, none of them are really satisfying. They all end with a phone call from someone who's still alive giving you a status update on everything going on in the underground, and I don't like it that much. But that's the point. You just did the bare minimum. You didn't go all out trying to save everyone and become everyone's friend, so you just get some simple text. I didn't bring up the final boss fight of the neutral route because it's too bombastic and frankly cool for my point about the ending to really work, and I honestly think that it's to the detriment of the ending as a whole. Undertale's pacifist ending not only sees you spare everyone, but also become friends with everyone, which is achieved through your own efforts to check up on the residents of the underground. You have to go on faux dates with Papyrus, Sundine, Sans, and Alphas for this to happen, though they're all more hangouts than actual dates. If you do this properly, then they'll come to your rescue when you fight Asgore and save you. There's a really heartwarming moment where Toriel meets the rest of your friends before Flowey kidnaps everyone and steals their souls. <laughs> yeah, that happens. It turns out that everyone in the underground becoming your friend and coming to your aid has allowed Flowey to gain all of their souls in the underground and become the most powerful being imaginable, returning to his original form, Asriel Dreamer, which is an anagram for serial murderer. <laughs> Crazy coincidence, that is. It's here that it's revealed that Asriel thinks you're his best friend, Kara, who died a long time ago. Like, a few centuries ago, a long time ago. And now he wants to trap you in a time loop of fighting him forever in order to make sure you never leave him again. Asriel BBD Icon? Joking aside, no matter how many times you die, your soul refuses to break. It's a hellish fight, but you're filled with hopes and dreams, in a literal sense because your inventory is full of hopes and dreams, and eventually you make him go to his full power. Now you can't control yourself or anything about the fight, and all seems hopeless. Until you're able to call out to your friends inside of Asriel. You have to make sure that each of them remembers who they are and fights back against being assimilated inside of him, and eventually, Azrael starts to cry. His final attack brings your health down to decimals like 0 0.000001, but he still can't kill you. He releases the souls, and eventually he'll go back to being a flower. But he tells you to live your life to the fullest, and gives you a big ol' hug. Ah, this guy tried to kill everyone, but now he's my friend. Then the game lets you go back through the entire underground and talk to every NPC. There's no encounters. You're just able to check on everyone, see how they're doing. Almost every NPC has new dialogue. It's such a cool concept for an ending. I mean, it's ripped off from Mother 2, but it's way better here because I actually care about the NPCs here. And when you get back to the first room in the game, Asriel is there, tending to the flowers. You can talk to him a few times to get new dialogue out of him before he eventually tells you to just leave. And when you do, you go to the surface with all the other monsters and break the barrier. Cue montage of the monsters living on the surface world in harmony with the humans. Everything about it's so cute. Everyone gets a satisfying ending. Except Asriel, who has to become an unfeeling flower again. Just after the game ends with a photograph of everyone together, he appears again as Flowey and asks you desperately not to reset the game, and just let everyone live together in harmony. There's a reason why I can't ever bring myself to do the genocide route. In the genocide route, you kill everyone. Typically, it's done after a pacifist route, as the meta-narrative of the game intends, but it's not a fun time if you do it that way. Flowey literally just begged you not to play the game again. I recommend doing it before the pacifist route to save your own sanity. 
Killing everyone you just ended up becoming friends with is a gut-wrenching experience. And there's only one person between you and the end. That person is Sans Undertale. Sans is kind of a meme, of course, but when you actually fight him, it turns out he's the strongest character in the game. Notably, he's one of the only main characters, save Alphas, who you don't fight in the neutral or pacifist route, and he is the last line of defense that everyone has in the genocide route. You've already killed most of the monsters. He couldn't sit by and watch you keep killing everyone. So you fight the hardest boss in the game, the only boss who can give you status ailments, poison, and the only boss who has the audacity to dodge your attacks. His final, ultimate move is to do nothing so you can't use your turn, until he falls asleep, or you have to move over the combat box to the attack button and hit it, which he wakes up and dodges, but you attack again and he dies. In order to defeat Sans, you have to destroy the idea of Undertale as a game. You have to play against its rules. He stumbles off, blood oozing out of him, as the only monster in the game who has ever bled. You set your sights on Asgore next and kill him in one hit, and then Flowey begs you not to cut him down, but you do anyway. The only person left to kill in the entirety of Undertale is you, the player. Kara turns on you, and in the final moments of the game before it crashes, you are reassured that your death is imminent. And for most people, that's where the story of Undertale ends. Not with a bang or a whimper, but with maniacal laughter and total fear. What could I possibly even talk about after the meta-narrative mindfuck that is Undertale? Well, I could talk about Omori, but I'll save that for another video. Specifically one coming out later this year. Hint, hint. Anyway, I'll wrap this video up with one of the most heartwarming endings in an RPG to lighten the mood a bit. The final moments of Super Paper Mario. Super Paper Mario is a dark game. A universe gets eaten by a black hole at one point while you're in it and nearly everyone dies. It's a brutal game that tries very hard to be poignant and mean something and a lot of the time it doesn't really hit its mark. I personally don't think that the environmentalist message of chapter 5 really hits hard because undercut by how casual everything surrounding it is, for example. Super Paper Mario is a bombastic game but it really doesn't go all out in some of the moments it wants you to take the most seriously. But man, it'd be hard for me to pretend that the ending didn't do anything for me. The ending of Super Paper Mario involves Count Black, the main villain, finally finding his lost love and thus his motivation for ending the entire universe becoming nullified. He's finally been reunited with the love of his life, Timpani, who has been transformed into a butterfly named Tippy that has been your companion for most of the game. But, surprise to no one, Dementio, the evil court jester, betrays Count Black and nearly kills him as he steals the pure hearts that the heroes gathered for him, along with the Chaos Heart, in order to become Super Dementio. The entire game was a ruse to get the MacGuffins just so Dementio could steal them and usurp Count Black. Just when all hope seems lost, in an endless battle against an invincible foe, the love between Tippy and Count Black becomes strong enough to make a new pure heart, one that defeats Dementio. The two of them disappear, and one of the most beautiful songs in any video game starts to play. Bounding Through Time, which is a combination of memory, the song that plays during the chapter interludes about their romance throughout the game, the main theme of Super Paper Mario, and Count Black's own theme, Champion of Destruction. To play it for you now would lose all the musical context built up over the game, so I won't bother. Just know that it's one of the few songs to make me cry just from listening to it. Maybe it's nostalgia speaking, but I genuinely think this ending is one of the most beautiful endings in any game, despite Super Paper Mario's various quirks and shortcomings. I'm pretty sure that most people who love Super Paper Mario love it exclusively because of this ending, but I've talked about this game for far too long already. RPGs are often too long for their own good, and the story can be weighed down by needless padding, but as long as they can nail the end, then I'm satisfied with my experience, because the ending is what I'll be thinking about for years to come. This has been Arcadian Everlasting, at the top of my tower, bounding through time, signing off. Thank you for watching.